Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, uh, Father Schaller and the rest of you for coming, for having me here today. Um, so it's kind of the introduction. And what we're going to do is, uh, this should be in your packet or would have been handed out to you, this uh, little insert called The Place of the Propers in Liturgical Prayer. Now, I'm sure if you were wondering, should I come to this or not, it was the title of this talk that really puts you over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the place of the propers in liturgical prayer. Please open the uh, front cover. Uh, and this is to uh, serve as kind of introduction and context for the things you're going to sing and learn and, and, and even uh, from the beginning to project what you might be able to take home uh, after this uh, conference is over. There's really three things that uh, I want to address uh, in this uh, short amount of time I have. And they're in the box there. First of all, what in the world is a proper anyway? If I type in propers, uh, like on this, for example, as I was preparing it, my spell check doesn't like that, where there's no such thing as propers to, uh, to Microsoft. Anyway, we want to get an understanding of what a proper is, because uh, many of the chants you will sing are categorized under this title of proper. Okay? Second of all, how does uh, the church direct their use, especially when it comes to liturgical music? And as Father Schaller mentioned, how does the church want us to use these? Not how he wants them to be used, or me, or the Pope, or how, what is the Second Vatican Council, the general instruction, the tradition of the church? How does that direct uh, their use? It's the second thing we'll look at. And third, again, why, why should we be concerned about these things? How might they help me, my choir, and those uh, who sing in our parishes at home? So these are the three short questions we want to address by way of introduction. Uh, if you have questions along the way at any point, Feel free to ask them. You don't need to wait till the end. Most of the time, I know what I'm saying, but uh, so if it's not clear to you, then just uh, let me know. So let's go to this first question. What is uh, a proper in the first place? This is uh, kind of a definition, I guess, that I came up with. A proper text, such as an antiphon, a prayer, or a reading, all of these can be propers. A uh, proper text has a particular or specific or unique, or the word here is proper attachment to a given day, feast, or season. It's a liturgically specific text. Okay? It's relevant to a very unique uh, celebration. All right? So let's take some examples. Uh, it can be the entrance antiphon for the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time, which is, to you I call, for you will surely heed me, O Lord. No other Sunday will have this text as its antiphon. Okay? It's proper to that celebration. Or again, the second reading of the third Sunday of Advent. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. The Lord is near. No other Sunday will use this reading. No other day of the year will use this reading. This isn't true for all readings, but it is for this one. This is proper to this particular celebration. Or again, the collect or uh, opening prayer from today. The North American martyrs. O God, who chose to manifest the blessed hope of your eternal kingdom, by the toil of Saints John de Brebeuf, Isaac Jogues, and their companions. Okay? It's used today and no other time. Right? We're not going to use it for St. Luke or the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, the reproaches for Good Friday are proper. They're proper to that day. Okay? Or the Ubi Caritas from Holy Thursday, or the Exaltet from the Easter Vigil, or the sequences that we use occasionally on, on a Sunday or Pentecost, Corpus Christi, etc. This is, these are examples of proper texts. And what they do is the character of the celebration really rests on these texts. They would, they, these are what make the celebrations what they are. So they're rather important. Now, there's a second category of texts which I'm calling quasi-proper. Uh, these have a, they're still specific, but they're spe more specific to a broader group. Okay? Sometimes they're called common texts. So, for example, the common of saints. In fact, if you look in a missal, the first part of it says the proper of seasons, then there's a proper of saints, and then there's a section called the commons. Right? So uh, for Mass today, Father Schaller would have used the collect from the proper of saints, the one that mentioned John de Brebeuf, etc., but that's the only proper text they have. After that, he had to go to the common of martyrs. Right? That's true. So I these think. are, what's that? That's true. I Good. Think. You did that? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> uh, so these are texts that are, uh, are kind of proper to a larger group. Or uh, there's a, a section of responsorial psalms um, that are more general. 
Okay, so for example, the Lord is my shepherd. Anyone ever heard that before? It's a very common sort of psalm response. Or if today you hear his voice, yes, this is not a very proper text. It's common to a larger uh, use. Okay? Or the uh, Psalms in the Simple Gradual, which is a book we'll look at uh, shortly. All right, so this is quasi-proper. It's a little bit broader. Now, there's a third category of texts after proper and common, and these are what's called ordinary texts, okay? or texts in the order of the Mass. So the sign of the cross, the greeting, the gloria, the dialogues, those are in every single Mass, whether it's, you know, whatever it might be. So those are ordinary texts. We want to focus on these proper texts, uh, especially in this part. Now, if you look at the next page, you see this is exactly what the Missal looks like for this Sunday. These are the proper texts for the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time. All right, so first we have uh, the entrance antiphon, proper, the collect or opening prayer, which will be used Sunday and on uh, uh, days in Ordinary Time for, uh, throughout next week, the prayer of the offerings, communion antiphon, prayer uh, after communion, all of these are proper texts specific to the 29th Sunday. Now, the readings are fairly proper, too. You'll hear the readings uh, Saturday night or Sunday. The first one is from Isaiah 53. It's about the suffering servant uh, whose, uh, whose affliction will take away the sins of many. All right? uh, the psalm is, Lord, let your mercy be on us as we place our trust in you. So you're starting to get the character of what this weekend's going to be like. Go back, just for example, to the antiphon. To you I call, for you, were sure, you will surely heed me, O God. Turn your ear to me, hear my words, guard me, protect me under the wings. Uh, so it's about hearing, protection, mercy, God's uh, unity with us. Right? The readings have the same character. The letter to the Hebrews is the second reading. This is about, we don't have a high priest who doesn't know what it's like to be one of us. We do. One who knows our afflictions and who is now seated at the right hand in heaven. Let's approach him in confidence. And the gospel is about the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. Right? So this is the character, I'm going to say the theme of the day, we don't really do theme masses so much anymore. This is the proper character of what we're about this Sunday. Okay, that is what is meant by a proper. Right? Let's go over the page. The second question we wanted to ask and address is, well, how does the church want us to use these proper texts, especially as it comes to uh, our song? And I want to look, just by way of example, about how we might use the proper text for the opening song, or the entrance chant, okay? And so this, uh, on page four, is what the general instruction of the Roman Missal, this is what gives us, this is really, as the title suggests, the instruction book on how to use the Missal at Mass. It tells us what we should sing at the opening. So look inside the box and read along with me. This chant is sung alternately by the choir and the people, first, second, by the cantor and the people, or third, entirely <coughs> by the people, or fourth, by the choir alone. Now that in itself is a little bit interesting. Uh, if At least according to most of the, the what I'm used to, it's always just the people alone. There's a lot of options here. There really are a lot of options. Okay, now this is the more important part. In the dioceses of the United States, there are four options for the entrance chant. The first is the antiphon from the Missal, or the antiphon with its psalm from the Graduale Romanum, as set to music there or in another setting. We're going to look at an example of this here. Second, the antiphon and psalm from the Graduale Simplex for the liturgical time. Third, a chant from another collection of psalms and antiphons, including psalms arranged in responsorial or metrical forms. And again, we'll look at examples of all of these. And the last, another liturgical chant or song that is suited to the sacred action, the day, or the time of year. So something that's kind of quasi-proper. You don't just sing any old thing. You're singing something that's kind of specific to, a, to these readings and what's going on on that day. All right? So these are our options. Now, what I, as I say, we'll look at the examples, but what I want you to notice here, number one is a proper text. Number two is a kind of quasi-proper text as is number three, a proper text. Number four, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It may or may not have anything to do with, say, the antiphon itself. All right? And we want it, if you go with option number four, we want it to be very close to that. This is why we need to be familiar with the propers. Uh, and then lastly, before we look at these uh, options in detail, what is the purpose of this entrance chant? 
wants to open the celebration. It, it accompanies the uh, procession. It fosters unity. And the fourth thing that the general instruction says is it introduces the thoughts to the mystery of the liturgical time of festivity. Okay, so this is the proper character. It tells us what the day is about right from the very start. Okay, so let's look at some examples here for this Sunday. Okay, this Sunday. So let's look at option one. What the general instruction says, we're at the top of page five now. It says our first option is the antiphon from the missal, or the antiphon with its song from the graduale romanum as set to music there or in another setting. All right, in that box, if you open up the missal, this is what you'd see as the proper antiphon for this Sunday. Okay, and it's from Psalm 17, or depending on how you number it, I've never really gotten all this straight. They changed the numbering once, of course, in the course of history, and sometimes it's 17, sometimes it's Psalm 16. You see that? And then there's the two verses, 6 and 8. And the antiphon is, To you I call, for you will surely heed me, O God. Turn your ear to me, hear my words, guard me as the apple of your eye, and the shadow of your wings protect me. All right, so this is the proper character of this Sunday. Now, one thing to note is this is scripture, okay? perhaps penned by, uh, or quilled, or whatever, however he did it, by uh, King David himself. Okay? St. James the Less sung this very psalm. The North American martyrs sung this very psalm. Tomorrow, Pope Benedict will sing this very psalm, right? as will we. So there's, there's a real kind of unitive character when, when we go with this uh, option. Okay. So the first one uh, is this antiphon set to music. And so you look in the box and you see the text, To you I call, for you will surely heed me, O God. And this is from Adam Bartlett, who uh, one of the books that was mentioned was this Lumen Christi Missal. And this is uh, the cantor's music for singing that, uh, uh, that psalm. So the text is from Psalm 17. And how this works is very much like a responsorial psalm. So this is the antiphon, To you I call, now, when you look at those last two bars, that's the psalm tone that you'll use. And below is the psalm verses, O Lord, hear a cause that is just. And how this works is you sing the antiphon, first verse, antiphon, second verse. As many verses as the psalm as you need, and it ends with the gloria, and you repeat the antiphon again. All right? So let's give this a try. <laughs> I'll, uh, it should sound something like this. <laughs> <laughs> to you I call, for you will surely heed me, O oh God. Turn your ear to me, hear my words. Let's sing that together. To you I call, for you will surely heed me, here is the uh, antiphon that from the Roman gradual, okay? which is uh, uh, the history of chances. So this is what, 8th century, 9th century, 10th? Really old, really old, okay? This is what you are going to be learning um, this week. Uh, it works the same way. Uh, so there's, you see Psalm 16, ego clamavi, uh, you see the translation down below, exactly as printed in the text. To you I call, for you will surely heed me, O God. All right, and it ends the second line from the bottom. You see P.S. period, then it begins exaudi domine. That's the psalm verse, just what we sang. Um, I've asked Aristotle to help me to sing this, or rather I will help him sing this. <laughs> so, please. Ego clamavi, 
takes a little more skill. You need to know how to pronounce the words. You need to know what the nooms and the various uh, uh, meanings are. But again, you're singing the prophet. You're singing the Bible. You're singing the scriptures. That's the first option given us by uh, the general instruction. Go to page 7, and this is option 2. The antiphon and psalm are the graduale simplex for the liturgical time. Now, what the graduale simplex is, any idea what the word simplex means? Simple. Simple. Yeah, something like simple. All right. Yeah, yeah. See, it means it's a piece of cake. Um, now, the, the, this intro is a little bit difficult, yeah? So the council fathers themselves said, let's produce a chant book that smaller parishes uh, would be able to sing, something that's a little bit simpler. And how this works, for example, there's eight mass settings for ordinary time. So you'd go and you'd find one that is close to that antiphon, now, our antiphon here is, to you I call, for you will surely heed me. This one is, um, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. So the same sort of thing, we call to God, he responds to us. In, inclinavi dominus, okay, incline, Lord, aurem suam, your ear, mihi, to me, okay? Inclinavi dominus arem suam mihi. Let's try that. Inclinavi dominus arem suam mihi. And then the verses. In, I'll sing the verses. Inclina domine arum tuam et exaudi me. Then repeat the antiphon. Again, the idea is you do as many verses as you need for the ministers to get to where they're going. And the last one is the glory of Patri, or the glory to the Father. This is something really that's lost when we don't do these chants. How often we say glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. All of these chants uh, end with this. You don't get out of Mass without praising the Trinity you know, a dozen times. So it's much more uh, uh, praise uh, uh, directed towards God. All right, let's go over to the next page. This is our next option, option three uh, from the general instruction. A chant from another collection of psalms and antiphons approved by the conference with the Dawson Bishop, including psalms arranged in responsorial or metrical forms. All right, well, this uh, comes from a book called By Flowing Waters, and there's an example over here, and it is, in essence, a translation of the simple gradual, except it's in English, all right? So, in fact, just listen to, this is the same corresponding uh, uh, chant, but now in English. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. Sound familiar? It's very much just like what we sang from the or it song, sister. What we just did from the uh, simple gradual. So I think let's all do this. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. 
answer me, for I am poor and needy. Together. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. All right, thus far we've been seeing everything that's proper, quasi-proper, all right? It's very close to the actual text of, uh, of the Missal. Okay, go to page 9. This is a... Uh, another uh, set of psalmody now in metrical form. So this is a, I don't know, an experiment. Uh, this, is a, this is a try to put these uh, antiphons and psalms uh, in kind of a hymnotic form, if that's the right word, a metrical form, that is still accessible, even more accessible to those in our pews. Um, now I've cut out the bass clef here so I could fit it all in. Anybody recognize that uh, tune though? Round it with many fountains. I call upon you, O Lord, for you will answer me. I pray that you will hear my words, give ear, Lord, to my plea. My Savior, keep me as the apple of your eye. Be shadow of your wings, in safety let me lie. All right, well, there's a, a lot of discussion on, you know, if this is, if you like this or not, the whole book is made up of these kind of common, uh, common tunes with the psalm text. The benefit is, though, again, we're singing proper text, we're singing uh, the character of the Mass, we're singing the Bible here. All right, over the page, and this is our last option, although, again, if... Uh, if uh, you took uh, most practices in most places on most Sundays, you'd think it were the first option. Another liturgical chant or song that is suited to the sacred action, the day, or the time of year. Similarly approved by the conference or the Dotson Bishop. This is the other appropriate hymn, okay, which has uh, kind of been, become the default uh, mode. And it may or may not uh, be close to the proper text. Uh, this one actually, so I chose this one because it's the Lord hears the cry of the poor. The, 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 the proper text is about us crying to God and God listening. And so in that second verse, uh, uh, let the lowly hear and be glad. The Lord listens to their pleas. And so I use that proper text in choosing which hymn uh, I would use. So I think most of us maybe know this. The Lord hears oh, the cry Maybe I don't of the Lord. We need the guitar. Blessed be the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. With praise ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. Who will hear the cry of the Lord? Okay, and then back to the refrain. So it's really working very, very much like what we've sung thus far. The text is based upon Psalm 34, but it's been uh, run through the interpretation of a musician. Um, all right, so in leaving the second part, how does the church envision us using the propers? Well, of the options that she gives us to use, the first one is a proper, the second one is a proper, the third one is a proper, and the fourth one is, should be close to a proper if it ain't. All right? um, it wants us to use the propers, or at least be familiar with them, because this is what makes that particular celebration to be what it is. Okay? Uh, it's, <laughs> I'm trying to think of analogies. It's the difference between having a quarterback or Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> okay? You don't just want a quarterback. You want a proper, particular, specific, unique, something that's yours. And that's what the proper texts give us. All right. So in leaving this, let's go to the top of page 11. Uh, these are just things that came to my own mind, and I hope by the time you get to the end, uh, you can add to this list. How can a parish benefit from the use of Proverbs? All right. First of all, it can increase your repertoire. Um, now, I would say it, this is the idea isn't for you to go back and you know chuck the hymnal and say from now on it's the uh, it's the Gregorian Missal or nothing. <laughs> I, I don't think that's the intent of this. But uh, so it's not. Think of it as supplementing what you already use. Okay, add to it, broaden your horizons, and uh, and the possibilities there. 
add to it uh, many of the things that uh, might not, uh, uh, you might not uh, sing already. I mean, look at what we did for the 29th Sunday of Ordinary Time. Okay, from Adam Bartlett, or the uh, gra Roman Gradual, or the Simple Gradual, or the Bi-Flowing Waters, or the Hymn Introits. Or there's, there's, it opens up a vast horizons for us. Okay? Second of all, it can be sung without accompaniment, and therefore, in many cases, can be more practical. Right? So my parish, 90 families, St. Philip's and Rolling Ground, uh, Maryland, our musician, uh, who's, I don't know, maybe 70, uh, re retired, okay? And so, well, who's going to do the music? People don't know, we're not, aren't as musical maybe now as we were back then, or, or this maybe we're 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, you had to make your own music if you wanted any music. Uh, so I have my kids and my nieces and my nephews are stepping in. Well, they're, you know, they're 16 years down to uh, nine. All right, and that limits what they can play. You know, there's maybe a dozen songs they can play pretty well, mostly just with the one hand. All right. Well, if we're limited to what is accompanied, we are very limited indeed. Okay. Uh, but, you know, my seven-year-old can probably sing, "Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me." Incidentally. Um, about my seven-year-old, I've been as I'm preparing for this. I'm preparing to sing tomorrow in uh, uh, the Nifty Neighbors 4-H Music Fest yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with my seven-year-old James, who's named after Saint James the Less. Let's call him Jimmy. He and I are going to sing Jimmy Crack Corn tomorrow. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> Me on the banjo, he at the microphone. <laughs> so from the uh, sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> how fresh it is. Anyway, but James can sing this. Okay, can be sung, can be done, practical. Third, as a basis for uh, choosing hymnody. Okay, most uh, most of us who choose music probably go to the go to the readings, and maybe that's it. Yeah, but that's not the whole picture. Maybe the first place we should start is uh, is the antiphons uh, themselves. Um, the 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 mass is so biblical. I really got a sense of this as we came to the new translation. You know, the sign of the cross is a Bible verse. Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Uh, the Lord be with you is a Bible verse. Jesus uh, or it's uh, Boaz says this to his harvesters. Uh, and with your spirit is a Bible verse, or is inspired. From St. Paul, it's inspired by the spirit of Moses that goes. The whole mass is so scriptural. To stick to the prompters or, or take them seriously is to, uh, is to stay biblical as well. You know, imagine if Father Schaller, you know, on Sunday said, you know, I'm not going to read the gospel today. I'm going to give you something based on the gospel, kind of my interpretation uh, or my reflection on the gospel. Well, you shouldn't stand for that. You shouldn't stand for that because the scriptures are ours. We need to hear them. Well, musicians do that all the time. I'm not. I'm not going to give you the uh, the psalm. I'm going to give you kind of my reflection upon that psalm. And I, I know it's not the same thing. We have options to do that to choose other songs. But uh, go with the Bible. This is the vernacular of the church. Uh, and then lastly, and, and by virtue of that. Uh, what we can take from this is hopefully a holiness and spiritual growth because there's a word in them words. Okay? As uh, St. Ephraim, who's a deacon and doctor of the church, says that, uh, that, that the second person of the Trinity kind of went, underwent a second incarnation. Not only did he take upon our flesh, but he took upon our words. He himself is the word who was there from the beginning and is now kind of contained, circumscribed in our own scriptural language. And so to sing uh, the scriptures is to encounter this very word. Gregory the Great says that the divine words grow together with the one who reads them or sings them. It mixes with us and makes us holy. Or again, Father talked about the clothing of the word. Pope Benedict has this expression about uh, sober inebriation. Or, <laughs> or drunken speech. Drunken speech. The word, the speech, that which is sober, is the Logos, the, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. We add our spirits, our breath. And this is, you know, if you want to buy a, a six-pack beer, go to the spirit store. <coughs> this is the inebriation. So it's kind of head and heart. It's the Son and the Holy Spirit 
we're able to add breath to those words. And so I guess my last word is always do the proper thing. <laughs> always do the proper thing. That's the place to start. Um, yeah, the place to start. Okay. Well, very good. I hope that's a suitable introduction for the beautiful things you're going to learn and sing over the weekend. All right. My contact information is on the bottom. So please let me know if I can ever be of service to you. Are there any questions right now for Chris? Um, on page nine, or I'm sorry, not nine, but on seven, <coughs> where is that from? I mean, that's the graduate simplex, but that yeah. comes from, you have the resources on the other ones, but you don't have a resource for this oh, one. Oh, uh, so the graduate simplex, oh, is there okay. a copy over there? Okay. Uh, it looks like this. Um, it's available from a, a number of places. It just seems real common because there's a lot of small parishes that I think and that they was exactly the point. That was exactly the point. It's it's uh, four smaller parishes. It's um, I labored all day on this introit over there, and I still came up short. This is much simpler, and it's supposed to be. Now it's a uh, you know, drawback is most of us can't negotiate the Latin anymore. Uh, you know, but you can provide a translation, and, and uh, becomes an option. Then. Gradually simplex, simple gradually. Anything else? So, uh, are, how, how do hymns fit in this? I mean, a typical hymn that we usually hear in most parishes. Uh, well, hopefully they do fit. Um, if they're chosen, they should be chosen based upon the proper texts, and not only the readings, but uh, the antiphons. They're legitimate options. But there's a lot of options that should be considered uh, and maybe employed uh, at least at the same time. I mean, uh, many of probably know hymns are more proper to the Liturgy of the Hours, to the office. You know, for 1,950 years, we never sang a hymn at the Mass. Never. It was all in, in the office. So um, our tradition is, uh, is really one of psalmody. Of psalmody. Um, you know, whether it's Marty Haugen or Ralph Vaughan Williams or Venuncius Fortunatus or, or any of these, uh, they're not King David and they're not, uh, they're not scripture. So uh, the place of hymns, uh, it's really not as broad as, as our practice has come to be. All right. Oh, I have a question. Why is, uh, why is the operatory chant missing from the missile? Uh, if I knew the answer, I would tell you. But it is. It is. It's in uh, gradual. Uh, but in the Roman Missal itself, it's not there. And I don't know why. I would like to have somebody's ear to find that out. I thought, surely, you know, it's not in the Latin edition. It's not in, therefore, in any of the translations. Do you have any? I read uh, somewhere that uh, this permission has been extended <coughs> to the uh, Diocese of the United States of America that you can sing the Missal antiphons like uh, we have in Adam Bartlett's setting. Um, but uh, in places, I believe, uh, England and Wales, for example, uh, the sun proper is always to be from the gradual. The missal propers were always for, were meant to be for spoken masses. And so for spoken masses at the offertory, you have the offertory prayer to the blessed are you, Lord God, all creation, oh, for your goodness. So they were assumed for spoke for low masses. Uh, and uh, the gradual proper is simple or, or Roman or meant for, or meant for the sub of the Makes sense. In the, uh, in the Lumen Christi Missal, uh, Adam, this is Adam Bartlett's book, uh, the offertory verse is included from, from the gradual. So it's all, all three of those, so both the, the entrance, offertory, and communion are included. English and Latin. English and Latin. And you get psalm tones for those. Or you can sing the actual one from the Latin. Well, one follow up on that. Um, so, like in daily masses with no music, are the, these antiphons supposed to be spoken and how are they by the priest or by the priest and congregation? What? The general instruction says the priest, the lector, or everybody. Okay. Those options. Yeah, they, if there's no music, they should be. But they should not be omitted, right? Uh, only if there's something else sung. Mm -hmm. But they should, at, least be at a minimum, they should be there. Yeah. You know, one of the challenges is that uh, 
And sometimes people can raise this legitimate question, well, how, how did they get dropped? And what happened that we, we weren't singing hymns for 1900 years and all of a sudden now all we have are hymns? What happened to those prophets? There's, a, there's a, some historical uh, background to that, simply that when the, uh, when the revision of the Mass took place after the Second Vatican Council, and then, of course, not only the revision of the Mass, but also <laughs> in the vernacular, that, that provided a substantial shift in the, in the practices in the parishes. And when the Mass came into English, uh, there was a real struggle then about all those texts, which were in Latin, and which were sung to, you know, to chant. And when you take Latin and you translate it into English, you just can't sing it to the same tones. And so there was, we had those, all those verses uh, in, now in English, but no music for them. So by default, hymns got put in there. And... Yeah, you know, one, one thing that I found is, uh, you know, if I were to give this talk 10 years ago and say, you know, we should really consider the propers, and people would say, okay, where, should, where can I get them? And then I'd say, well, you know, you, 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 you can't, can't really, because there aren't any resources yeah. anywhere. So, But a, a lot's happened over the last 10 years where there's many more resources and many, much more accessible materials to be sung. So, very good thing. Anyway, I'm way over my time. So. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.